Thank you all for joining us at COVIDCon today, presented by the Human Rights Foundation. Um, I'm Melissa, and I'm the New York editor of Spectator USA and the managing director of Ideas Beyond Borders. And I have here with me Mr. Kyle Bass, the founder and chief investment officer of Heyman Capital Management. He's been studying China for a very long time and is one of Wall Street's most outspoken critics of the Chinese Communist Party. He's the founding member of the Com Committee on Present Danger, China, and was the 2019 recipient of the Foreign Policy Association Medal. Um, so, hi, Kyle. How are you doing? Hi, How are you? Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, what the pandemic has revealed about uh, Chinese economic dominance. Much has been made about China's rapid rise as a global power, both economically and politically. But let's zero in first on, on this, Chinese, this part of the, the, the debate topic, China's economic dominance, and frame that before we get into the conversation. So Kyle, the stage is all yours. Sure, Melissa. So it, it's important to note that China's uh, rise politically has been built on this foundation of the fact that their, their socialism with Chinese characteristics is, is better than the rest of the world's called Western democracies or free market capitalism. And that um, their rise economically has led to their political rise. And I think it's important to note that, that their economic rise is in the eyes of China. And, and we talked about this a little beforehand. It's important to note that there are four wars that the West is that could the West could be fighting with China, uh, three of which we are fighting. One, let's hope we never get there. But the number one, the one, number one war is the narrative war, the information war, which China is so adept at playing. Uh, the number two is the economic war. Number three is the cyber war, and number four is kinetic war. So we're fighting three out of four wars with China as we speak. But as it relates to their economic quote dominance. Uh, it's, uh, they claim to be the world's second largest economy with about 15% of the world's GDP, and yet less than nine-tenths of 1% of global transactions settle in Chinese currency. No one trusts the government. Uh, no one trusts the currency. No one allows their monopoly money to pay for anything around the world. And so it's, it's a little bit of a misnomer uh, that they so adeptly have put together this concept of economic dominance when, in, in essence, they rely on the United States dollars, euros, yen, and pounds, but mostly dollars, uh, to uh, rise both economically and politically. And, and it happens to be their Achilles heel. And we can talk a little bit more about that if you like, but it's important to note that uh, it's somewhat of a Potemkin village. Uh, I won't argue that their economy hasn't grown massively uh, in the last 20 years, but it's in very important to note that if they opened their capital account, if they fully opened their economy, uh, their currency would collapse. But do, you, so, but do you think that the response to the pandemic has revealed anything about um, what happens when countries are too economically dependent on China? Yes, I mean, clearly uh, the, the bright disinfecting light that the Wuhan virus has been shining on, uh, the, the manner in which the Chinese communist government operates is, is, uh, is actually going to be a good one over time. You know. The world is now seeing and losing trust in, that the CCP has tried to build over time with all of even their allies. You even have Iran and Pakistan criticizing China's response to the crisis. As we all know, there were north of 100 cases in Wuhan prior to December 31st. Uh, and really, when it got to uh, January uh, 23rd uh, is when Secretary Xi decided to cut off all air travel within China from Wuhan but, but yet he allowed all international air travel from Wuhan to continue, to continue. It's as if he said, well, we're going to go down. We're going to take the world down with us. Uh, and then he got Tedros at the World Health Organization to say, uh, January 18th, there's no human to human transmission. There's not a problem here. Don't close borders. Closing borders is xenophobic and potentially racist. When that was exactly the right thing to do when President Xi himself shut down travel from Wuhan within China. That big mishap is shining the light on China's malign intent around the world and also on now on supply chains around the world. And some of those supply chains actually relate to severe national security concerns that some have been sounding the alarm on before, but uh, let's just say uh, uh, to set, uh, falling on deaf ears. But now all of a sudden, uh, it's falling on the right ears at the right time in the right place. So I think this, this virus pandemic is going to cause enormous changes in how 
both countries act with their national security complex and companies act with their supply chains uh, in their, and their lessening, I think they'll have a lessening reliance on, on Chinese supply chains. So why, why do you think the WHO was so deferential to China and, and what other supranational you know, institutions have been compromised? You know, um, I've, I've been very vocal about China's infiltration of the World Bank. For many, many years, China has, has played, you know, they play a very long game. Uh, and they have infiltrated a number of supranational institutions around the world, one being the World Bank, one being the WHO, which, as you know, is basically a part of the UN, UN Human Rights Council, uh, should be called the UN Unhuman Rights Council, uh, due to the number of are, are, are the basic members of that council. They have infiltrated many of these organizations. The w, WHO, you know, look, Tidros, as you know, is a member of the, of the Maoist uh, political party of Ethiopia. Uh, in fact, hundreds of American doctors filed a protest to him being named the head of the WHO for his squashing and apparently uh, uh, concealing enormous cholera outbreaks uh, in, in various countries in Northern Africa. So, you know, the fact that Tedros is, is, a, is a Maoist party member, you can imagine who his allegiances are to. And if you read the WHO uh, announcements and their press releases very carefully, you see that he says, after consultation with Xi, or after consultation with the Chinese Communist Party, we have determined that there is no person-to-person -person, uh, 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 infection here going on with the Wuhan virus, when in fact, we all know and they knew at the time that it was a, a, a severe problem that the Chinese government was actually uh, censuring and punishing those that were, that were saying anything about it on WeChat, including the, the seven um, heroic doctors in Wuhan that first uh, noticed this mnemonic anomaly uh, in their hometown. And um, so what, what kind of propaganda and misinformation campaigns were used by the CCP to undermine the investigation into the cause of the COVID-19 outbreak? And why do so many media outlets seem to, be, seem to appear to unwittingly do their work for them? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, look at, you, look, you look on Twitter, there are over 70 official blue-checked accounts from the Chinese government, whether it's uh, ambassadors to various important countries or uh, state ministry spokespeople. I wonder why, since Twitter is banned in China, why do we allow the propaganda of the Chinese government uh, to uh, infiltrate, let's just say, U.S. Uh, platforms like Twitter, like Facebook, like many of these others? Um, and, and, and again, this, this concept of reciprocity, uh, I think, has to be brought to the forefront. But, uh, that the fact that, that uh, the WHO relied on a conversation with Xi, uh, and now, as you probably see, even the South China Morning Post today uh, is saying that uh, Xi has lost trust in the international community, and that's actually a pretty big step for that uh, newspaper uh, or online journalistic uh, repository to, to, to come out and say, as you know, uh, owned by Jack Ma and Alibaba, is a, that's a big step. So. I think you're starting to see the globe and the globe's responsible countries realize that China and their government, more importantly, the Chinese Communist Party, you know, uh, lies, cheats, and steals for a living. And it's important to note that we, we can't take them for their word. And, and I think that light is being, is being shown on them in, a, in an unfriendly way uh, from now on. So speaking of uh, the Jack Ma Foundation, um, as infection rates are decreasing within China, you know, the Chinese government and even very big companies like Huawei and Alibaba, um, they're reaching out with, with what I'm starting to call mask diplomacy. Um, are these attempts at soft power pushes? Um, are they just basic economic reality? And, and how should heads of state respond to these efforts? I mean, it's so easy to see what they're doing. If, if you followed Ambassador Kui, uh, the Chinese ambassador to the U.S. wrote an op-ed uh, in the New York Times, of, of all places, uh, about 10 days ago. And in that op-ed, he, he says that we need to cooperate, the U.S. and China. And in fact, in paragraph two, he says Huawei is do donating masks to both Washington, D.C. and New York City. Now, why they chose those two, those two cities to donate masks, I'm not sure why the Chinese ambassador to the United States 
is promoting what what he deemed to be a, what China deems to be a private company when we all know uh, all the SOEs are, are basically state run. Uh, it's it is soft power diplomacy giving masks. Now, one of the reasons why uh, that it's that it's that has been shown. One of the reasons why Secretary Xi has covered up uh, the human to human transmission and the lack of transparency in January was we all know now through various outlets all over the world, uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, dictated to other companies that were Chinese companies to hoover up all of the personal protective equipment, including masks, all over the world for use in China. And now they're diplomatically giving them away uh, to places like Washington, D.C. and New York City. I mean, it's kind of a joke. And uh, again, their policies are so easy to see through if anyone reads the entire timeline and understands uh, what, what really is happening here. So how do you forecast um, how China will be dealt with after this? Yeah, I think, oh, well, you can see that the narrative in the press has actually really changed over the last couple of years. You know, two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, the narrative wasn't, uh, wasn't as insightful as it is today. It also wasn't as critical of the Chinese Communist Party and their, and their methods of operation. And now you see a very um, interesting look at the world from the perspective of, of, of mainstream media. And mind you, some of these mainstream media outlets take full page advertisements from companies like Huawei uh, and, and, and actually inserts from the Chinese propagandists, the Global Times, the Xinhua, the China Daily, right? Uh, all of those different players pay these news organizations. So the news organizations are very reluctant with, with dwindling subscribership for their, for their uh, print versions. Um, they have to weigh the cost benefit analysis of being critical of uh, the CCP versus their, their incomes. And that's, that's the carrot the CCP dangles out in front of just about every organization in order to coerce them to do what they want to do. But I think what changes going forward uh, is the national security complex step, steps in. And, you know, uh, one woman from the Hastings Foundation, uh, uh, Rosemary Gibson, wrote a book in 2018 about the U.S.'s over-reliance on China for our drugs, for both prescription and non-prescription drugs. And um, she's been sounding the alarm for a couple of years now, and now all of a sudden everyone's listening to her. Uh, but I had the benefit of meeting her uh, over a year ago, and we talked very specifically about if, if uh, a 100% of U.S. blood pressure medicine is made in China. 90% of the active pharmaceutical ingredients for all of our prescription drugs are made in China. That is insane. Uh, and that will change. And I think there are places where you look at CFIUS and the U.S. review of strategic acquisitions by the Chinese government and Chinese, quote, private companies. We've, we've blocked a number of very big deals. Broadcom, I think, being, uh, you know, one of the biggest. Uh, and I think we've We've disallowed chip foundries to be bought by the Chinese or Chinese companies, but we've really missed prescription drugs in the, in the slow bleed uh, of, of moving to places like China. And I think from a national security perspective, we're going to move those things back on shore. And then that's the government's response. The private company's response is going to, I think, rely a lot less on a, uh, you know, tyrannical dictatorship's policies to, to build those key elements of their supply chain in, into countries like that. So do you think, um, and, and this is both, I guess, ethically and, and legally, should China be paying some sort of restitution um, for, for deceiving the world and undermining, you know, some sort of global response? Yeah, I mean, it, it's clear when you look at the timeline that they're, that they're, uh, diversion, their lies, their cover-up of, of the Wuhan virus early on uh, was seeking to not only benefit them, but to severely disadvantage the rest of the world. And she, Secretary Xi's uh, policy of closing air traffic between Wuhan and the rest of China and allowing air traffic globally between uh, Wuhan and the rest of the globe was, was an intentional, we're, if our ship's going down, we're going to infect the world. Uh, and you've seen several arguments made, uh, one by a Harvard professor and one by a few think tanks in the UK, laying out the architecture for a legal 
uh, groundwork by which uh, uh, I think you can you can basically start suing Chinese government, Chinese SOEs for their malfeasance. And this is a long held belief of mine. Uh, when you look at the ideological differences between uh, a tyrannical dictatorship run by the Communist Party and a Western democracy run by like the US, UK, Australia, uh, we are never going to outlie, out cheat or out steal their government uh, because we won't stoop to their levels to do that. But what we will, what we should do and what we will do is use our strengths against those governments. Our strength as one of the foundational bedrocks of our country, uh, it happens to be our rule of law. We need to simply start enforcing our laws against the bad actors in China and around the rest of the world. And if we stick to enforcing our laws, uh, we will absolutely level the playing field. And you and I were talking earlier, you know, we said uh, in a free trade world, China wins. In a fair trade world, the, the US wins. Yeah. And so we need to get it back to this concept uh, of fair. When you drive into the U.S. Commerce Department, there is a an etched, um, uh, let's say, block of limestone that says, you know, trade amongst countries or trade amongst nations must be both fair and equitable. And that's Benjamin Franklin's quote. We need to get back to that point because this concept of unrestricted free trade between a communist dictatorship and uh, and a Western democracy just isn't going to work. So how do you see the trade, U.S. trade war being impacted as a result of this? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's my view that uh, China has been fighting a trade war for the last 20 years. We just figured it out uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and again, that war needs reciprocity, whether it's the number of journalists in one country or another, whether it's the amount of trade and what we're allowed to trade and what, what sectors of each economy we are allowed to participate in will allow them to participate in. Again, this simple concept of fairness and reciprocity would take us a very long way into leveling the playing field with, uh, with the malign intent of the Communist Party. And um, what do you think about the calls to, uh, for, for Chinese debt cancellations by some members of uh, the U.S. Senate? And you mean uh, Belt and Road yeah. uh, debts? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we all know that that the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is is multifaceted, but it's it's a, a manner. It's the way in which China is essentially uh, colonizing through debt diplomacy uh, Northern Africa and parts of the Middle East and strategic places around the world where they either want a deep water port or they want communications networks set up or they they these are long term strategic decisions. And these Belt and Road Initiative loans, we all know that Uganda can't ever repay the Belt and Belt and Road loans. We all know that we saw Indonesia with the port uh, that was lent to, you know, three times over what it should have been lent to. This concept of debt diplomacy by China uh, has to go away. And the question is, it, would gunboat diplomacy follow, i.e., if these nations uh, just decided to default on the Chinese loans, uh, what would happen next? Uh, would China come in and try to uh, colonize these areas with gunboat diplomacy, or would they go into some sort of financial restructuring? And it's 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 my view that many of these projects, even if you look at their uh, their crown jewel, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative projects, is in Pakistan, and it's now just a dust bowl of empty promises and failed deals. You look at their deals in Nicaragua; they were going to dig this huge canal and pay all of this money and have all this GD, resultant GDP yeah. in dil digging their own canal. It's, a, it's an empty project. So a lot of these Belt and Road initiatives, you know why? They need dollars. This goes back to my original point. China needs blood to fuel the tumor of the Chinese Communist Party. And that blood is US dollars. They can't print US dollars. So they have to figure out one way or another through BRI loans, through BRI initiatives, how to raise dollar revenues. And I, I think that is their Achilles heel and that they, they will fail miserably. Thank you very much. I think, you know, we, we should open it up for questions. There have been some questions that have been filling up um, and I just received uh, one. So I'm gonna ask you, um, how do you feel about US investors unintentionally funding the regime's power plays? and giving them further legitimacy through trillions of dollars invested in emerging markets index funds like VWO with 41% in China or EEM with 39% in China. Yeah, I mean, 
um, the, the Chinese Communist Party is very sneaky in what they do. And the manner in which, uh, once, they, this, once they started running a current account deficit, they run a huge fiscal deficit, they started running a current account deficit because of their desperately short raw materials, or desperately short food, they're desperately short energy. They need dollars to buy all of those things. So they had to figure out another route to get dollars from and, and another area to get dollars from. So they started uh, coercing MSCI and the various index providers to include China in these passive indices. Now, again, this goes back to this point of Chinese companies don't have to adhere to the same standards as US companies. Uh, US companies have to submit themselves to public accounting oversight for real audits. Chinese companies don't. If you include the listed Chinese companies in America, like Alibaba, Tencent, and those others, the Chinese representative ownership of, let's say, the MSCI uh, EM index is north of 48%. It's almost half the index. The fact that not only U.S. retirees are unknowingly investing in companies that are building the Chinese surveillance state, that are actually building the Chinese military that may be used against the U.S. one day, but think about this, even the U.S. Thrift Savings Plan, the plan that is the retirement plan for Congress, the Senate and the U.S. military, the Thrift Savings Plan has money invested passively in the MSCI indices, which means our military members, pension plans, are going to fund the military of one of our strategic adversaries, one of our potential mortal enemies in, in the uh, South China Sea. It is absolutely insane. And the Chinese have made it possible to allow this to happen. And we need someone that's very strong in the Securities and Exchange Commission. We need someone that understands this in the National Security Council to actually, again, level the playing field. Just force Chinese entities to submit to the same audits U.S. entities do. And this is a, 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 a much less well-known fact. Do you know that when Chinese companies list in the U.S., and let's say even when Chinese state actors invest in U.S. venture capital firms and they make huge returns, billions and billions of dollars, you know how much tax they pay? Zero. They don't pay a dime of U.S. tax. There is no capital gains tax for a foreign investor. That should change because guess what? We all pay tax. We pay tax mm -hmm. to fund our legal case. system and the court system. And when the Chinese uh, want to sue someone in the U.S. and adjudicate a wrong that they deem to be done uh, against them, they use our court system to do so. And they don't even pay for our court system. And so it's crazy that we don't have a fair and reciprocal tax system with China. It's, it's crazy that we don't force them to adhere to the same basic standards as U US companies do. Okay, the second question is, is coming from Twitter. Um, will the US, the Euro European Union and other regional blocs juxtaposed against China be so weakened after the pandemic to mount a challenge to the Chinese economy? Oh, no, I, I think that, again, that's part of the Chinese propaganda machine. When you look at the developed West, uh, they, we all have open economies, and, and to a, mostly the G20, right, has uh, op open economies, free-floating currencies, and central banks, minus a couple of, of actors. So, you know, if you have economies that are open, you have central banks uh, that are willing to do whatever it takes to, to fight back the Wuhan virus. Uh, I think the West will emerge much stronger here. I think China is mm -hmm. overplaying its hand and it is going to be very weak uh, because I think, again, they, they have a desperate need for dollars. And uh, when you look at leverage, you just think back to the global financial crisis of 2008. Uh, you remember Iceland, Ireland, and Cyprus, they fell like flies. Uh, they're sorry, they felt like dominoes Domino. uh, because they're, I was thinking dropping like flies. Uh, they felt like dominoes uh, because their banking systems were nine and 10 times leveraged to their GDP. Mm -hmm. um, when the US went into our, our financial crisis, and we know how bad that was in 2007 and eight, our banking system was only one times levered to our GDP. If you look at off balance sheet, we're another three quarters of, uh, of one time. So 1.75 times leverage is where we were as an economy. China's three and a half times their GDP today in their banks. Hong Kong is almost 10 times. Ten. Yeah. So you have enormous leverage issues and you have a huge deflationary glut hitting China and Hong Kong right now. So I think when you compare the developed West to China and specifically, uh, let's just say China Inc., 
I think uh, I think the West is going to come out of this in a much better place. Now, Europe's another is another issue because Europe never recapitalized its banks in the last crisis. They still don't have a central taxing authority. They have the same problem they had in 2011, which is more leverage and more losses in their banks. I don't know. Uh, let's see, absent Germany will, being willing to change the capital key and lend directly to co- countries like Greece and Italy, the euro is still going to have a problem holding together. Uh, but I do think the West is generally going to be better off than, than China is. That's, you know, I'm sure that's making all of us feel that's, that's some good news in the sea of just terrible news in the last few days. So um, I think with that, that's the end of our session. I'm sorry if we didn't get to, you know, most of your questions, but at least we got two in. So thank you guys. Thank you, Kyle, for, for joining us today. And thank you to uh, Human Rights Foundation for uh, organizing this virtual conference. Yeah, thanks to the Human Rights Foundation. Thank you too, Melissa. It's a pleasure. Oh, you too. Thank you.